Hi there, folks. My name is Anders Van Sant, and I am an assistant professor at the University of Wyoming in the Department of Agricultural and Applied Economics, as well as an extension specialist in community development. I've been putting together a series of reports on how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted Wyoming's economy and thought you all may be interested in some of the information related to Wyoming's agriculture. If you are interested in learning more, you can either wait for the actual report to come out or reach out to me via email, which is both at the beginning and end of this presentation. We're going to start off by looking at a quick snapshot of Wyoming agriculture before COVID-19. After this, we will dig into the meat of the presentation, no pun intended, and look at how Wyoming agriculture and food were influenced by the pandemic. Specifically, we will look at Wyoming's top commodities, farm finances, consumer spending, local food systems, and state initiatives. Due to the lack of data, at times we will pull national statistics and then put them in the context of Wyoming. Pending this all goes well, we'll make it to the conclusions and highlight some of the main takeaways. All right, let's get started by looking at a snapshot of Wyoming agriculture before the pandemic. This bar graph shows the number of agricultural operations in each ag industry in Wyoming for 2017, the last ag census year. The smaller numbers above each bar show the total operations in the industry, whereas the larger bold numbers represent the total sales for that industry in millions of US dollars. Cattle is by far the largest agricultural industry in Wyoming, with total sales nearly reaching $1 billion, and only a small share of that being from fed cattle. Immediately to the left of the cattle industries is other crop farming. Most of these operations are likely hay or sugar beet operations, two highly valued industry in the state. On the far right, aquaculture and other animal production make up a significantly large share of agricultural operations in the state, although the industry has lower total sales than oil seed and grain farming and hog and pig farming, and is only slightly above the total sales for sheep and goat farming. This pie chart breaks down the share of farms and ranches in the state by total sales. About 38% of Wyoming farms and ranches have annual total sales less than $2,500. Most of these operators likely engage in diversification strategies, alternative markets, and or have other sources of income. Only 30% of Wyoming farms and ranches have annual total sales above $50,000, with 5% earning sales above half a million dollars per year. When we look at local food operations, we see that although direct-to-consumer operations were by far the most abundant, direct-to-retailers and food hubs pulled in greater sales. In 2017, there were 569 producers with direct-to-consumer marketing pulling in about $3.5 million in total sales. In contrast, there were only 80 producers with direct-to-retail or food hub marketing. However, they pulled in $18.5 million in total sales. All right, now we're going to look at how Wyoming agriculture has changed since COVID-19. This is a 2010 USDA map showing the number of federal and state inspected processing plants across the country. The map is a little dated, but it gets the general idea across that Wyoming has limited processing capacity and that most of our animals are sent out of state to be processed. For context, Wyoming processes about 5,000 cattle per year while JBS down in Greeley processes about 5,000 head per day. Now, we have probably heard stories in the news about these large processing plants like, and including JBS, having to reduce production due to COVID-19 outbreaks amongst employees. So let's dig a little deeper to see how differences in processor sizes has affected local and national market sale, cattle markets. Here, we see the year-over-year -year percent change in cattle slaughtered measured in head by state, with the national average represented by the dashed red line. We see Wyoming's smaller processors actually increased the number of head processed. Montana, with many small but some larger operations, mostly processed more except for in June. Colorado and Nebraska, however, have much larger processing capacity in more normal times, but due to the virus's greater ability to spread in their larger processing plants, both of these states were hit hard. <clears throat> For example, in April, Colorado slaughtered 53% fewer cattle than in the previous April, and Nebraska processed 40% fewer cattle in May. We can see this trend continuing across the country. 
This graph from Dr. Jason Lusk over at Purdue shows a comparison of how Stace's percent change in slaughtered cattle between 2019 and 2020 compares to how many total cattle were processed in that state in April, May of 2019. We see those states with the most cattle processed in April, May of 2019 had the largest decreases in production. This is represented by the blue dots farther out to the right and below the X axis. These large processing states are in juxtaposition to the historically smaller processing states closer to the Y axis that tended to increase production to account for the bottlenecks in the beef supply chain. This map shows the change in April and May cattle slaughter between 2019 and 2020. Again, it shows that states with smaller processing plants like Wyoming were able to increase the number of cattle processed, while those with larger processing facilities reduced production. In this sense, Wyoming passed COVID-19 stress tests on the meat packing industry, although it should be noted that in order for meat to be sold outside the state, it must be processed at a federally inspected plant. For this reason, Wyoming and several other states are looking to increase capacity and acquire more federal inspectors. Here we see the beef cattle prices from January 2019 to September 2020. There was a dip in the price of steers and heifers as cattle processing plants reduced production to limit the spread. This supply chain bottleneck led to a higher supply of cattle unable to be processed and drove down the price for finished steers and heifers. While this supply chain bottleneck temporarily drove down the prices for steers and heifers, it appears markets are not expecting a long-term slowdown in the industry, keeping the price of calves relatively steady. And the small boost in the price of cows is likely due, at least in part, to an increase in demand for ground beef over the summer months. This graph shows the producer price index for producers of slaughter cattle. The producer price index, or PPI, is kind of like the consumer price index, except that instead of measuring changes in consumer prices, it measures the changes in producer prices. So if the PPI goes up, it means things are relatively more expensive for producers. Here, we see that the PPI for cattle producers decreased initially in the year, but has been pretty volatile since then. Nationally, rel relative prices for these producers are about what they were last August. This graph shows the producer price index for producers. Uh, oops. The PPI for hog producers has also been relatively volatile, reaching an annual low in July and an annual high in October. However, looking at the previous year on the left half of the graph, the volatility appears to be only slightly higher than in 2019. All right. Now we're going to transition from looking at livestock to start to consider some more crop commodities. Let's start by sticking with the producer price index, but instead look at the PPI for all farm products. <clears throat> Relative prices for producers dropped at the beginning of the year, but it appears the pandemic has played a role in increasing producer costs across the national agriculture sector. Starting in April, when the, when the pandemic really set in, we have seen relative prices increase almost every month this is likely due to the myriad of supply chain bottlenecks, not only in agriculture, but also manufacturing and other agricultural inputs driving up prices for producers. This graph displays hay prices in dollars per ton for Wyoming and the U.S. for July and August 2019 and 2020. Along the horizontal axis, I've broken down hay into three categories, all hay, alfalfa hay, and other hay. In July, the average price for all hay in Wyoming was about the same as last July and was only slightly lower in August. Wyoming alfalfa prices were down about $15 in August compared to last August, but the national average was only down $7 for that month. In contrast, other hay, or any hay other than alfalfa, was up $15 in August in Wyoming, while the national price was only up $8 compared to last August. This slide shows barley prices for Wyoming in the U.S. for 2018 and August of 2019 and 2020. In Wyoming, the bushel price of barley was only about five cents less than last August, but still 17 cents higher than the average 2018 prices and higher than the U.S. average bushel price. After some uncertainty and stress over the Wyoming sugar beet harvest, it turned out to be a good harvest. Earlier this year, some sugar beet farmers were concerned about the accuracy of weather forecast and being able to know when to harvest. 
with air travel down about 50 percent less weather data is being collected leading to less accurate weather forecasts for farmers and inclement weather is still on the front on the forefront of these farmers minds as last year's sugar yield was down 40 percent due to some hard freezes this year the industry dealt with drought and warmer conditions but the farmers were able to compensate with irrigation Despite the uncertainty caused by COVID-19, it turned out to be a good year with the harvest expected to match a five-year yield high of 32 tons per acre and a record 19.6% sugar content. This graph from the Kansas City Federal Reserve shows survey responses from banks across the 10th district on how farm households financial conditions are faring compared to non-farm households. Wyoming, Colorado, and New Mexico are grouped together in the mountain states category in the center right of the graph. It appears that at least in May, a larger share of agricultural households in the mountain states were faring worse than non-farm households compared to the other states in the 10th district. About 60% of farm households were at least somewhat weaker than non-farm households in the mountain states in May. However, it should be noted that this graph does not tell us if, there was, if this was an increase from previous time periods or how farm households in the mountain states have changed since May. At the end of the agricultural supply chain are the consumers who have seen significant price fluctuations across food groups. This graph shows the year over year percent change in food prices by group. In June, the reduction in processed cattle led to meat prices being 12.8% higher compared to the previous June. Prices still have not yet come down. Comparing this October's prices to last October's, meat prices were 6.1% higher, cereal prices were 3% higher, and fruit and vegetables were 2.6% higher. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, grocery prices were up 2.6% between March and April. This was the largest monthly increase in the food at home price index since the 1970s, and was largely driven by increased demand at grocery stores. Wyoming's local food systems, including our smaller meat processors, generally have greater flexibility due to their local and shorter supply chains. This increased flexibility allowed local food systems to be more dynamic in how they adapted to COVID-19 shocks compared to larger industry players. However, the strain from COVID-19 has led to some Wyoming regulations being more scrutinized. For example, the Wyoming Food Freedom Act was amended in March and more amendments around simplifying labeling and other improvements to the act are being considered by industry leaders. The Wyoming local foods industry was perhaps most influenced by the closure of retail market outlets, reducing direct to retailer sales, as well as other COVID-19 restrictions hampering the operations of farmers markets. Additionally, local food sales may be disproportionately affected by lowering incomes across the state. This is because local foods are more income elastic or price sensitive compared to non-local foods. U.S. online food sales increased across the board. E-commerce grocery sales increased 450% between August 2019 and May 2020, and the number of orders increased 357% over the same time period. While the increase in local foods' online sales and orders were not as large as those for grocery stores, the basket size for online local food purchases increased 71% compared to grocery stores, 25%. Given local food operators are less visible and accessible compared to brick and mortar food retailers, it will be interesting to see if COVID-19 has accelerated development of a new online market space for local foods, or if this is just a temporary trend. COVID-19 has spurred several state initiatives to support Wyoming businesses and households, including some aimed at agriculture. The Agricultural Fund sought to compensate lost revenue from COVID-19 related expenses and made $90 million available to Wyoming producers with up to $250,000 available per applicant. The Meat Processing Expansion Grant Program made $10 million available to expand the capacity of meat processors through capital investments with a maximum of half a million dollars available per applicant. Unfortunately, because the funding source of the meat processing expansion grant was through the Federal CARES Act, all of the funds must be spent by December 31st. From my conversations with Wyoming Department of Ag folks, it appears this may have been too restrictive of a timeline because at the time of this recording, only 20% of the available funds have been spent. 
there are legislators working to extend the grant availability period, but nothing has been set in stone yet. As was briefly noted earlier, the Wyoming Food Freedom Act was amended in March to allow for third party sales of non potentially hazardous goods and to allow for herd share agreements. The third party sales have the potential to increase the market size for small scale home production and the herd share has potential to increase the flexibility of local livestock producers and expand the sale of meat to local markets. Several other states have pursued similar legislation, but there are still many questions by Wyoming producers on the details and mechanisms within these new laws. As we conclude, I will underscore a few findings from the presentation. Bottlenecks in the beef supply chain backed up Wyoming cattle producers, but have also opened up opportunities for Wyoming cattle processors. Hay and barley prices were largely unaffected, at least in the months we considered. Early uncertainty over weather forecasts and in a good year for sugar beet producers. Farm financial conditions do remain a concern across the mountain states, but more recent data is needed to see the true impact. Consumers saw the largest single month increase in grocery prices since the 1970s. And finally, shorter supply chains have allowed greater flexibility for small producers and Wyoming legislators appear to be supporting the local foods industry growth through new amendments. References for the presentation. And finally, I would like to thank you all for attending this presentation. If you have any questions or comments, you can reach me through my email, paste it here. Thanks again, folks.